Our Bible study today is on Daniel chapter 2, beginning at verse 29. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as Daniel came before King Nebuchadnezzar to interpret his dream, we're thankful for his humility and recognizing that you are the only one who truly has knowledge, and we must look to you. And of course, that knowledge comes from the fear of the Lord and recognizing Christ as the head of, of all creation. And so even as Nebuchadnezzar would eventually come to acknowledge God, Yahweh, as the true God of the universe, may we always live our lives with that same acknowledgement, uh, submitting to Jesus uh, through the re repentance of our sins and receiving of the gifts of his kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so we finally get to the part where Daniel is brought before King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonian Empire. And, and of course, this king is definitely, um, I know he, he is one of the most arrogant kings. And I, I guess in general, kings are pretty arrogant, but he's definitely uh, very full of himself. You know, I mean, the, the kings of, uh, of Egypt, they, they all believed that they were divine beings, that they were gods, right? Well, Daniel was no, in Daniel's uh, experience, Nebuchadnezzar was no different. You know, he thought of himself as a divine being. And yet, you know, he finds these limitations where he has a dream that, and then it doesn't even, we're not even sure if he even remembered the dream because some people, are, uh, scholars believe that because he demanded that the, that the Magi or the wise men tell him what his dream was, is maybe it's because after he had it, he, he forgot it. The only thing left was his being troubled in his spirit. But, um, you know, we're not sure if that's exactly what that meant. But certainly, he, you know, he sees his own limitations because he's not able to interpret it. And so that's why he's asking for the wise men to do it. And uh, when the wise men are, you know, told to show up and tell him what it is, it's so that he can find out if they have this divine connection, right? If they, if they can't talk to the gods, he doesn't want to talk to them. Uh, so in verse uh, 29, you know, he, it kind of repeats what it said in verse 28 where it talked about how King Nebuchadnezzar, um, Daniel said, um, what will, it's a, the dream that he had was, what will happen in days to come? Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. And then he kind of repeats it. Part of the repetition in biblical literature is, you know, that it was never meant to be read because people d couldn't own Bibles. I mean, there was no way of making enough copies for everybody. So it was always something that was on a scroll and you read it. So you had to have sections that repeated the same sentences several times so that people who would, they would get it, right? You know, if you don't repeat yourself when you're, uh, like in sermons and stuff, people don't always get the point. So same thing with oral information it has to be repeated okay would somebody read verse 29 to you O king as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this and he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be okay so uh you know he, he just talks about how the king had been laying in his bed and that this and these mysteries are revealed and notice that it, it tells us who is the you know you know kind of a oblique way he describes who the uh, who the person is who gave him the dream right it wasn't just that it was his dream who was the person who gave him the dream yeah, yeah well and it calls what does it call him in this text it's, it calls God the revealer of mysteries right revealer of mysteries yeah and so depending on which translation you have NIV says the revealer of mysteries so that's a description of God and, uh, and the dream is actually, in, in verse 29, it, it doesn't call it a dream, but it calls it, a, you know, it, um, the revealer of mysteries shows you what, the, what is going to happen. So I, I think in the text, specifically in the original, it talks about a, re a revelatory vision from the revealer of mysteries. So it uses that same root word, the idea of it's a revelation, and it's given to him by the revealer. So dreams, you know, I guess whether or not we, 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 we would say that all dreams come from God, I don't know. I would say sometimes, you know, a bad dream can come from a, 
a bad piece of fish or something like that. But, <laughs> but definitely uh, something that's meaningful is going gonna, is gonna to come from God, is the author. Uh, and it uses the phrase uh, about the, what things will be. Uh, if you look back at verse 28, he, he talked about, um, you know, it says God in heaven who reveals mysteries. So there, that's the description that specifically that God's the one who does this. It says, he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. So that phrase, days to come, what does that sound like to you? Future. Okay, yeah, it just sounds like the future, right? And, uh, and then verse 29, it says, he is going to show you what is going to happen. So those two phrases are found throughout the Old Testament specifically to talk about um, a certain type of, of literature, right? So if, if I gave you a, a different translation of that, you might have a better idea of what I'm talking about. So if I, if I use the phrase latter days, so he says to, to King Nebuchadnezzar, this vision is of the latter days. What does latter days mean to you? That's right, Ruth. End of times. The end of the t end of the days. Uh, what else does it refer to? Future. Uh, well, not just the future. I mean, like tomorrow's the future. J Jesus' is second coming. You know, the book of Revelation. End of the world. Earthquakes, wars. Kind of like the stuff that we see on the news all the time. Although Jesus told us that the stuff that we're seeing on the news is not the end. It's only the birth pains. It's the beginning of the end. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, it's all relative. You know, for us, it might be a long time. For God, a second is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a second in his sight. And that's from the Psalms. Yeah, so that phrase, the, the literal translation in the, here this is actually Aramaic, the latter days, is uh, it's specifically, you know, in the Old Testament, is pointing ahead to the Messianic age. Right? It's talking about the coming of the Messiah. So the whole Old Testament, you know, Daniel is one of the last books of the Old Testament. I mean, not in terms of where it was placed, but in terms of writing. Right? And, it, and it was written during the time that the Old Testament was almost completed. Right? And so it, it's talking about the Messianic age. So here he's like leading us up to the point where he's saying, you've heard all about the Messiah, and now I'm going to tell you the Messiah is coming, and it's going to happen after these four different groups of uh, empires are coming, uh, you know, uh, rising and falling, right? So inside the dream that we're going to hear, there is a message that the Messiah is coming at the end. So, so for Nebuchadnezzar, he's, all, he's only interested in hearing about what? Dream. Yeah, he, himself, his dream right now, what is this going to do to me? He doesn't care about the, the latter days, the future about things that are going to happen after he's dead, uh, or whether or not, you know, he's, he's only interested, am I going to lose my kingdom? And that's part of the trouble that he thought, is like, am I going to lose my kingdom? Well, the, and the f facts are that he, ne he doesn't lose his kingdom in his, in his time of life. It's going to end after he dies, which, you know, in his case, he doesn't even care anymore. But, uh, but for a Christian, this is talking about the messianic days, the ushering in of the Messiah's kingdom, not just worldly kingdoms. Uh, and there's actually uh, an equivalent phrase that's found in the New Testament that we can connect with what it's talking about, about this latter days. Let's look at a couple of those examples. Acts 2.17 uses the phrase. Is the word apocryphal? Is that that's right. appropriate? Yes. Apo about, yeah. Well, see, no, okay, apocryphal. Apocalypse. Apocrypha means hidden writings, and the Apocrypha is the name of the books that were written between the Old and New Testament period of time. So they're written in, uh, in Greek, they were written after the Old Testament was finished, and that Old Testament had already been accepted as God's word, and then the Apocrypha were the writings of the Jewish people as they were fighting against the Greek Empire, and then some of those were, came into the were finished being written during the time up before Jesus. Um, the verb apocryphal, or more adjective apocryphal, which means which means hidden, right. and uh, and it, well, literally hidden writings, yeah. or writings that are hidden, and uh, and so apoc apocalypse is actually the better tr uh, 
description because what we're seeing, whenever you see the word latter days, that is apocalyptic because it's talking about end of time. Right. And so that's what this section is about. So the version or the verse that we can look at is Acts 2.17. So that's actually a quotation uh, uh, during the time of, um, was it, I think it's Peter's sermon on Pentecost Sunday, right? And it's, he's talking about, he's quoting from Joel's gospel, uh, Joel's uh, prophecy, that is. And Joel, of course, is a very apocalyptic um, uh, type of uh, prophet, similar to the book of Daniel. So Daniel may have taken some of the um, way that Joel wrote into his own ideas because uh, it's both, those are probably the two closest books in the Old Testament to each other. Although Joel is more uses a lot of Hebrew poetry to talk about the apocalypse, whereas uh, da Daniel uses narratives. He doesn't he doesn't use Hebrew poetry. He just tells stories and interpretations of things that happen to t talk about the end times. Okay, and then the, let's see another one is Second Timothy three verse one. Okay, so and, and yeah, so P Paul is writing to Timothy, a young pastor, and he's talking about, you know, things are going to get worse. And now, there's kind of a, an idea in apocalyptic literature is that every disaster is just a is just a preview of the final disaster. So you know, it may seem like it's the end of the world for for the people, the Christians in the first century when the Romans were killing them and almost wiped out the church. But God said, no, 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 it's not going to end here. But that was like a microcosm of, the, of how it's bad it's going to be at the very end. Uh, and we see that in some of the prophets as well. I think like Amos talks about how every disaster is, is like a prelude to the final disaster. So like, you know, locusts eat up all your food. And it talks about world starvation. And he talks about earthquakes. And talks about how that's going to happen all around the world eventually. So Revelation kind of uses that imagery. Okay, and another one is um, Hebrews 1, verse 2. Yeah. You got it? Verse 2, Hebrews 1, 2. Yep. But in these days, he has spoken to us by the Son, who is the appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. Okay, so uh, in, yeah, in these last days, right? Is that what it says, in these last days? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it, it uses that same... In these last days. Right, right. So it, it uses the same phrase. That's a translation of the same way that it's talking about in Daniel. So notice that Daniel is talking about in the latter days, and now in Hebrews it says in these last days. So he's basically saying they've, sh they've arrived. They've shown up. That the time of the Messiah is here. And so Hebrews is about showing how the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Okay, so back in Daniel. Yeah, well, Jesus has already appeared. So, I mean, we're already in the Messianic age. Uh, and that's one of the things to, um, to note is that, you know, the book of Daniel is trying to give comfort to the people who are in exile. And in a lot of ways, it's a, it's a metaphor for us. We're the ones who are in exile as Christians. Our citizenship is not here, but it's in heaven. So we are not in our final destination. We're going to go home someday. And so right now we're living as strangers in a strange land. So the Babylon is kind of like the wilderness that the Jewish people wandered in for 40 years before they got to the promised land. When the people were in the exile, Babylon was the wilderness until they got back to, Jew, uh, to Jerusalem, their homeland. And for, for us as Christians, the world is the wilderness of sin until we get to the promised land of heaven. Okay, so um, lots of examples of the idea of this messianic age that's being ushered in. And, and that helps us to, to put the dream of, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar into context. Because, uh, you know, just from the on, the on the surface of it, it's really hard to 
accurately describe what it's talking about. I mean, obviously, you know, there's been a tradition of, in Christianity to interpret it a specific way, uh, and that's the traditional way, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But there are also higher critical scholars that have reinterpreted it in the last 200 years because of their uh, inability to believe that you, anybody could predict the future. Okay, so let's see, verse 30, uh, verse 31, or no, well, verse 30, I think. Yeah. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Okay, so, and as he's talking to the king, notice that he doesn't, say, I know what this dream means. And he doesn't say that the king knows what the dream means. Even after he explains it, he's not saying that the king under, understands it. Uh, and so um, part of what of the way that it's written is to give us a clue as to wh what is the source of wisdom and the source of interpretation, right? So it uses what's called a passive voice, right? So when you think about like a verb, I can say, you know, so and so hit me, or I can say I was hit, uh, I was hit, right? So was hit is passive voice. It doesn't necessarily identify who did, did the hitting, who was the actor or the agent. But in this case, when it says, when he says that the mystery has been revealed to me, and then I think when it says, uh, the, where it says in verse 30, the second half, O king made, uh, so you, O king, may know the interpretation uh, I think the, in the uh, original language, it actually says, uh, it says, so that, uh, so that uh, they, that is the, the visions, would be made known to the king. So it's, it's actually in passive voice as well. Three times, passive voice. So who is the actor? Who's the one who, who does the revealing? God. God, exactly. He, it doesn't come right out and say it, but it's, it's showing us that God is the only one who gives wisdom. God is the only one who gives interpretation. You know, and sometimes using the passive voice is just a way of being able to talk to people who don't believe in God so you don't offend them. But you know, if they're honest with their hearts, they'll, they'll know that, oh yeah, I couldn't figure this out. And somehow there's a way of understanding this, so maybe there's a God. Right? So Daniel believes in God, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't, or at least he doesn't believe in the God of Israel. And so he's using the passive voice in a way of talking to the king so the king maybe doesn't get angry, and maybe his own conscience will eventually bother him enough that he'll come to the truth. Daniel's not taking any, any credit. That's right, yeah. And so Daniel is also showing humility by using the passive voice, letting the king know that God is in control. I mean, he actually did say in the previous verse, uh, like 20, well, even 27 through 28, talked about how, you know, the revealer of all mysteries. He's talking about there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. So it's not as if he was purposely trying to hide that God's in charge. It's just that, uh, you know, by using the passive voice, he's still giving credit to where credit is due. Okay, in verse um, 31. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. Okay, now as we go through the rest of this chapter, you won't hear anything else about the description of the statue in, in terms of, of this. So what are the three things that it tells you uh, that the statue appears as? Okay. Okay, the word, it says enormous, so it's large. Mm -hmm. Dazzling, mm -hmm. so it's like the way, is the way that it looks. And then the third right. verb, okay, and so, and like NIV says awesome, and the ESV says frightening. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, different translations might say that it is, um, uh, yeah, yeah, large, bright, and frightening are the three, three words that I wrote down. <laughs> but it doesn't mention that again. So, but what do you think? those represent because you know it's just a dream so daniel doesn't see it but he's just describing it that way okay well that might be a good way of describing it but you know he's, he's talking about well 
uh, as we get into it, you know, I'll just describe it real quick. He's talking about there's four, a statue made of four metals, and they represent four different kingdoms. And he tells them, he, do, he tells them each one is a kingdom, but he doesn't say which kingdoms they are. And so for us, looking in hindsight, you know, we can say that they represent the, um, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. And not everybody agrees with that because uh, if, it ref if the fourth kingdom represents the Romans, then that means that Daniel was talking about something that happened 500 years after his lifetime. And you know, modern historical critical scholars can, will never concede that telling the future is even a possibility. So they would say that he couldn't have, dis he couldn't have seen the Roman Empire he couldn't have described it. He didn't know anything about it. it. It didn't even happen. So the fourth kingdom, since it doesn't say it's the Romans, they would say, oh, that's just the Greeks. And the Greek empire was starting to grow, and it's even a possibility that somehow Daniel might have known about it. So he wasn't really telling the future, according to historical critical mm -hmm. scholars. But those three descriptions, it was enormous, uh, dazzling, and awesome, is, is a description of the kingdoms, right? So these kingdoms are... are um, are uh, powerful and they're glorious. And later on in uh, verse 37, if you jump ahead, you know, he does describe it uh, in that way. He talks about the dominion of the kingdoms, the power and the might and the glory in verse 37. So, uh, so the description of what the statue looked like is about how powerful these kingdoms are going to be in the future. Okay, and how about the next verse? Uh, 32. It had of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Okay, so in verse 32 and 33, you have the four parts of the statue, and actually kind of like a fifth part, right? Because the, the feet are made of clay mixed with iron. So, you know, a statue with uh, gold head, silver shoulders, bronze waist, iron legs, and then feet mixed with clay and iron. Okay? Right, the four kingdoms. And, you know, and then the idea of a, of a, of a statue made up of four different metals is uh, if throughout ancient Near Eastern literature, there, there are some examples of this type of thing. So... I mean, there, there's one that was written, you know, during the time of the Roman Empire by, um, by a uh, Greek poet or something, or maybe it was a Roman poet. And so that would be long after the time of Daniel. But the most likely connection would be to, uh, let's see, uh, there was a, a Greek poet called Hes Hesiod, Hesiod in the 8th century BC, and he, he wrote about a statue made of four different metals. And he uses the same four metals that's found in this description here. <laughs> you know, but uh, scholars who have tried to like compare, is Daniel copying this guy? And uh, the, the, the description in Hesiod's um, poetry of a four metal statue has nothing to do, there's no, no other descriptions besides the four metals that has anything to do with this vision. So, you know, to say that one influenced the other is not likely. Um, but what is probably likely is that God used uh, a description of a statue with four metals which had already appeared in other cultures in the ancient Near East so that when Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, it was, it was more familiar. So it, was, it already was something he had heard about, maybe. It was in the writings of other people. Other, maybe other people have talked about it. But, but there's, um, I think there's four big differences between... Um, uh, between the uh, Greek version of a four metal statue and what this story talks about. Be, you know, a li little bit later on, he's going to talk about uh, in verses um, 35 and 36, you know, th 34 and 35, about how um, one of the differences is that it talks about how the feet are iron mixed with clay, which no other uh, ancient writer mentions. The second one is that there's a difference, it talks about a stone that's gonna smash the feet of the statue. That's unique to this vision. And then it talks about how that stone becomes a mountain. Uh, so that, yeah, those are the three main differences between any other example of this type of a vision 
in any other writing. Okay, well, well, let's talk about that when we get to the stone, because I was kind of jumping ahead. So in verse uh, 32, the head of the statue is made of pure gold, right? And its chest and arms made of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze. Uh, so like I had mentioned, the, um, the head of the statue is, is uh, not just uh, Babylon, but it's Nebuchadnezzar himself. And then as you, as you look at the different metals, what, what's the difference between them? Right? What's the difference, difference between gold, silver, bronze, and, and iron, besides being different metals and different colors? There we go. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, if you were to compare the, the different uh, interpretations, as I already mentioned, you know, if these, which the traditional view is that the four empires are um, Babylon, as the gold head, P uh, Persia as the silver arms, um, Greek, the Greek empire as the bronze waist, and Rome as the iron legs. That it's not that Babylon was that much bigger or greater than the other kingdoms when it comes to size, because actually the Roman empire was by far one of the largest land areas of any of these. Babylon only covered um, uh, Iraq and Iran today, but the Roman Empire covered all of, I mean, from England all the way to um, Iraq and Iran and even further south into Africa. So it actually covered like three continents, parts of Asia, parts of Africa, part, all, most of Europe. So, you know, Rome, maybe Rome should be the head of gold because it's the, it's the greatest, but it's not talking about land area or size, it's talking about value. So the difference between the uh, parts of the statue are one, parts are more valuable, and it, he never really gets into why Babylon is considered the most valuable. And I have some of my own theories about this, but I, um, you know, any questions about the different metals? My my uh, Bible has the second, third, and fourth kingdoms suggested would be Media, Persia, and Greece. Right. So where, where's Media? Remind me. The Medes and the Persians ended up uh, co collaborating and creating a kingdom. And so Media is in southern uh, Mesopotamia. And then the Persians would have been further to the, to the uh, east of that. So, and so that, your Bible's description of that is the higher critical version that rejects the idea that Daniel had any idea about the Roman Empire. And so uh, that... You know that that would be something that I would just completely reject because the reason why they reject Rome is because they don't believe that he has that he had the ability to see that far into the future. Whereas you know if God's the uh, the one who gave the vision, then certainly it could be talking about the Roman Empire. And there's a lot of reasons why the Roman Empire fits better with the iron legs and the clay feet than anything else. Later on, it does it does say. That Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Instead of us reading here, the diminishing value of metals from gold to silver to bronze to iron mm -hmm. represents the decreasing power and grandeur. Right. So the value is directly related to the power. No. So if you think about, you know, like we're jumping ahead about who the kingdoms are. But the kingdom I just dis described to you, uh, you know, this might be something you're not as familiar with, but you think about, like, who controlled the Babylonian Empire? Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar right? We're, one guy mm -hmm. had total control of an entire empire. Nobody told him what to do. Nobody gave him any authority. to. Uh, he, he, he would kill people who he didn't agree with, he had lots of advisors, but that was by his own choice, right? All these wise men that are, uh, he's r r raising up for himself. He's not saying that the wise men had any right to tell him what to do. He'll take their advice or he'll leave their advice, but he was in total control. But then the Persian Empire, which was to come afterwards, his great-grandson, Belshazzar, is going to be killed by, um, uh, by Cyrus 
or maybe I'm not sure if it's Darius or Cyrus, but the, the, when the Persian Empire takes over, all it does is it kills the guy who's in charge of the Babylonian Empire, and then they just take it over. And, but the Persian Empire was, like I said earlier, was made up of the Medes and the Persians. So you had two ethnic groups that came together, didn't always agree with each other, and as a result, it wasn't a unified country. You know, the head couldn't necessarily have absolute power. And here's an example of that. You know the story of Esther, right? So when, when the king of the Persian Empire got talked into by Haman to, ha to execute the Jews, and then he finds out his wife is Jewish, and then he tries to take the law back, what, what happened? He couldn't do it because the Persian kingdom had a, a rule that nobody could you can't take any laws back. Once it's written, it's written. So it means that you've got to be careful what you pass because you might regret it in the future. Yeah. So, yeah, so he, uh, so, you know, whereas Nebuchadnezzar would have laughed about that. He would have said, you know, if I want to change my mind, I will do it and nobody will stop me. But the Persian Empire already had some uh, checks and balances that kind of weakened their absolute power of their rulers. Then we get to the Greek Empire, you know, I mean, it started out pretty strong, right? Who, was in, who started the Greek Empire? Alexander. Alexander the Great. And so he started in Greece. He started going east. He conquered all of, uh, you know, Israel and Syria and Mesopotamia. And he kept going east all the way to India. And then when he got to India, uh, he, uh, on his way back, you know, he set up all these new territories. He set up rulers to take care of them, like governors. And on his way back, do you know what happened to him? He got yellow fever and he died. Well, all of a sudden, this empire that he created would look like it would crumble. But would it, who took it over after he died? His commanders. Yeah, he, he had four, four commanders. I don't, I'm not actually sure if they were his sons or not. I don't think they were. But, but the four commanders split the kingdom up. And so the areas were, they were Greek, but they took over different areas. So there was... The Seleucid Empire, which was, um, which was uh, where Israel and Greece were, I'm, or I'm sorry, Israel up through up to Syria, that is, in Turkey, and then there was the Ptolemies, that was the empire that took over where Egypt is, and then there was uh, the guy who took over the Greek area, and then a, a, th a fourth guy who took over everything else to the west, I think, and so, um, you know, so the Greek Empire was really just it was. Four, three or four rulers who may or may not have agreed with each other, and they kind of just did their own thing in their own territory. So you can see that there was this is an empire that started out strong, but really was diluted. It, its value wasn't as strong or as powerful or as much because they had too many rulers. And then of course the Roman Empire, which is the last empire, why would that be iron? Not as valuable, not as powerful, it was very strong, right? Because metal, the metal is strong. Uh, it could withstand a lot. And in fact, the staying power of the Roman Empire is still seen with us today, right? I mean, think about the institutions that the Romans started are from architecture. You go to Washington, D.C., and what do you see? Roman architecture, which actually they stole from the Greeks. <laughs> and, uh, and then their institutions, democracy, uh, legislatures, Congress, and all the, the rest is all based on Roman Roman governance. All and roads and aqueducts. And yeah, there we go. Ro built, it's still there. Yeah, I mean, there, there's all kind. Of, I mean, the invention of the road is a Roman invention. So we have highways that are based on something that 2,000 years ago started by the Romans. In fact, there are still Roman roads today that are still serviceable and, and you can still drive on. And the width of the road track. Yeah. That's right. the The width of the of the chariot axle is the width of a train axle. I'm going to check it out Tuesday. I'll be in Washington <laughs> D.C. Okay, you make sure that it's still the width of a chariot. <laughs> and so those things are uh, kind of like iron. It's long lasting and strong, but because it's less valuable, it was val less valuable because even though they did have you know um, the Caesars who were in charge of the Roman Empire, it seems like they were absolute emperors. But, but were they? N not, not entirely. Yeah, in the beginning, they had to, they had to um, the Senate had a lot of control. And even later on, when they did kind of take over and kind of dismiss the, the democratic processes, they still had, uh, they couldn't do whatever they wanted. They had to 
the, the empire wouldn't work if they didn't, uh, you know, make backroom deals with different, you know, generals and other well, politicians. Aren't they the ones that came up with the state for checks and balances? And, yeah, and, exactly. The checks and balances, which, the right, which, which stole the absolute power from the emperor. Yeah. So the emperor was just like kind of like a figurehead, but he didn't have the absolute so control. The emperor was sort of like our constitution. Yeah, well, maybe like a president too, because like a president doesn't have absolute control because he, the, the judiciary and the Congress both have power as well. So, and that's why our government really does reflect some of the lasting institutions of the Roman Empire. You know, but Nebuchadnezzar is thinking, oh, look at me, I'm, I'm the greatest, I'm the most valuable, I'm the most powerful, and he was one of the most powerful emperors that ever lived. Well, Daniel sort of, sort of puffed him up there. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, uh, That's right. Yeah. I think the, the Greeks had an incredible impact, even though they're sort of sandwiched between other empires and other eras in history. Yeah. I mean, how much how much of Right. Well, the Romans were not so much inventors of these things, but they were kind of, uh, they just took them over, right? So the, the, the Roman Empire was enamored with, uh, with the Greek uh, architecture. So they, they kind of just stole it, and then they just reinvented it. So a lot of the statues in the Roman Empire were actually copies of Greek, uh, Greek statues and Greek architecture from earlier. They just kind of, you know, made it a little bit fancier. Named the gods. Yeah, so you have like Corinthian, you know, columns, which are just, they're columns, and on the top they're more, they're less ornate. Then the, the Romans, they copied them, but they wanted to make them fancier, so they have, you know, they have, they have like tops that have a lot more carving around them. So they look like the Greek version, but they, they feel like they improved on it and made it better, right? But they kind of just copied what they conquered. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's something that maybe happened, but a lot of times, you know, a Roman emperor would. Uh, well, this was in Greece. Oh, yeah, in Greece they would they could do that. that was the beginning of artificial intelligence. Is that <laughs> 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 well, we, we have some people like that today. If you uh, get an upper lobotomy, it gets the air in you. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So. Uh, Okay, so some of the things that we learn about in uh, the descriptions here uh, help us understand. For instance, uh, let's see. Um, uh, I guess we got to read a little bit further. Okay, so let's go to the next verse in verse 34. Yeah. Verse 44? 34. 34. Oh. While you were watching, a rock was cut out not by human hands. It struck the statue on, on its feet of iron and clay and smashed it. Okay, so you got the statue and now you got this uh, rock and the rock uh, struck the statue and it, it smashed it. Okay, so if these represent four kingdoms of the world that are going to happen during the time of Daniel all the way into the first century AD, so it's like a 500 year, 600 year period, um, what does the stone cut without hands represent? That's right. It represents, well, for Christians, it represents Jesus. But for Daniel, it, it probably was a picture of, of the Messiah, right? So Because they don't know who the Messiah is going to be. But um, by using the phrase, a, a rock that was not cut by human hands means that it's of, of a divine origin. So the Messiah is going to be from the line of David, according to you know, the Old Testament scriptures, 2 Samuel 7. But also, the Messiah is going to be from God, a divine origin. So throughout the Old Testament, you see descriptions of the Messiah as human, line of David, but as divine, son of God. So, and so here, you know, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know anything about the Jewish religion or the Old Testament faith, but the description here is already, because you know this is in our Bible, not it didn't get saved in the Babylonian scriptures or anything. It was for our benefit. So we can see that you no, know, even when kingdoms rise and fall, 
that God is still in control and this divine figure, the, the stone that the builders rejected becomes the capstone. So that's the stone it's talking about. Right? And that's from the Psalms, isn't it? Right? And then that's quoted in the New Testament by Jesus to describe who he is when he says, when he, you know, they ask him, you know, give us a sign. Who, what authority do you have this? And he says, you know, the stone the builders have um, rejected has become the capstone. And, and I don't know if any of the people at the time thought about Daniel because this, because he, he, he is talking about a stone cut, but not by human hands. So uh, describing the divine origins of the Messiah to a, a foreign king seems out of place to describe Jesus, and yet the whole scriptures are all fitting together. They all have a purpose. They give a, a, every prophecy of the Old Testament gives us a different piece of the puzzle of who the Messiah will be. Ruth? Uh, it possibly, I'm not absolutely sure the origin of that. Um, you know, sometimes there are, you know, multiple uh, metaphors that lead to uh, a saying. So I didn't research that, but it's possible that that may be where it came from. You know, there are biblical origins for lots of sayings. For instance, when we talk about, you know, um, talents, like, you know, if a person has, you're very talented. Well, the word talent comes from the from, uh, from the Old Testament, or no, the New Testament parable of the talents, which is actually a type of money, right? And then, uh, and so that's, there's an, uh, a biblical New Testament origin for, for that word. And that's, that might be the same for this as well, the feet of clay. Uh, but, but we're not sure. But definitely the, the feet of clay then shows us how this empire, this final empire, which is most likely the Romans, that it became fragile, right? So iron is super strong, but clay is super brittle. It's, it's not going to hold up to a whole lot. So what happened to the Roman Empire that made it eventually brittle, that made it susceptible to be broken so easily? So think about the Roman Empire. It starts out strong and powerful. It changes the world. It makes the, the Pax Romana, the peace that made it possible for Jesus' birth to actually have an impact in the world. Because if Jesus w would have been born before then, there would have been too much chaos. You wouldn't have been able to travel. How would the gospel spread if nobody could hear about it because you couldn't go out of your city because it was too dangerous? But the, the Romans made it possible for travel throughout the Roman Empire to happen easily and for ideas to be transported because of what they had done. But then eventually something happened to the Roman Empire that caused them to fall. Who knows what the fall of the Roman Empire was? Invading hordes from Some people would claim sides. that yeah. it was the, the barbarians. But, but um, okay, so a little history lesson here <laughs> is that uh, in the, uh, the fourth century, um, uh, Thomas, or no, uh, Augustine, Augustine of Hippo. He, Hippo was the name of a, of a North African city where uh, St. Augustine was the bishop. And he wrote uh, the book called The City of God, and he talked about how the Roman Empire in the 300s was already starting to fall apart. And what caused it to fall apart? It was the immorality of its leaders, right? So sure, they were attacked in the four, 400s, and eventually by the 500s, the hordes had come and taken over Rome and the barbarians destroyed it, but it, it was destroyed long before the barbarians ever got there. It was destroyed because the, the emperors were living these licitious, very evil lives, right? They were sleeping around, they were, you know, having orgies and, you know, immorality was rampant. And it wasn't just among the, it wasn't just among the, uh, the rulers, but it was among the, all the elites, right? You've got these people who think they're above the law, People who think that, that they can do anything they want. You know, what happens to any country when immorality takes hold at the top? That's right. It's, a, it's the rot. You know, it only takes so long before people rise up. I mean, you know, think about Iran. You've got leaders who are uh, uh, killing women for showing a little bit of their hair. And this one woman who was killed in, a couple years ago, 
ra riots all over Iran happened because of that because of a ridiculous law that was really kind of a um, trying to keep control of the country, and it happened all around the world. People were uh, rioting around the world for this woman who was killed, and she had done nothing wrong, right? So I mean that's immor immoral. You know, when, when people who do bad things get killed, people kind of turn the other way. You know, if a person, if, a, if a, uh, a leader of a cartel gets killed in Mexico, nobody complains about it because they're already doing some evil stuff, human trafficking and bribes and drugs. But when, ev when innocent people get killed, eventually people won't stand for it. It'll, it comes to a point where people will rise up. Well, one of the geniuses of the Roman Empire was that it was, uh, it had always been uh, accommodating and basically just uh, 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 took over and absorbed all kinds of other cultures. I mean, so th the idea that there was uh, foreigners coming in is not really true because what they did is they just kept expanding, expanding, expanding. So maybe they were absorbing cultures and other foreign countries into the Roman Empire that that might have been partly why it got weakened because you have groups that don't always agree and have different religious beliefs. But they, the, the way that the Romans thought about it is um, let's all un unify around or be, unite around the idea that the gods like you know Zeus and the pantheon of the gods are in control of our country and that you can worship your gods all you want as long as you acknowledge our gods as well. And most of the countries had no problem with that. They said, okay, we're going to worship our gods, and then we'll nod to the Roman gods. But the Christians were the only ones who said, we will not worship anything other than Jesus as Lord. And so that's why they were being killed. And, uh, and, you know, and eventually the, the immorality of killing innocent people who refused to worship the emperor got so horrible that people eventually stopped going to the Colosseum to watch the games where people were being killed. Mostly it was Christians being torn up by lions and wild beasts or gladiators would go out there and, and cut people up and people would be cheering. Eventually people stopped going because it was so disgusting. Yeah. You know, their conscience got to them. They, they saw, I can't sit here and watch this stuff. This is not right. And the, uh, the way that the story goes is that it was like in the late 200s that um, somebody in the, a Christian was being killed in the, by a gladiator and somebody was, uh, a, it was a, person who, I don't know if it was a Christian or not, but he, he said, you know, uh, was yelling that this is wrong and this must stop. And then, and eventually and he, he walked out and a whole bunch of people walked out of the Coliseum and they say that that was the last game in the Coliseum that ever happened because uh, they, re, they walked out on the, the murder, the martyrdom of a Christian and the culture just moved beyond it and they didn't do it anymore. So yeah, there was immor immorality that caused um, the Romans to, to fall apart, and I think that's similar to the idea that the feet of clay made it brittle and it, it collapsed. Because notice all these other cultures above it, they still had influence in, in, into the Roman Empire because they absorbed a lot of their ideas. But as soon as the Roman Empire collapsed, chaos ruled. It all came falling down. You could, you could say it's immorality, but couldn't you also say that they were worshiping false gods? Right. Well, in immorality, uh, I mean, idolatry is the highest form of immorality because it's, it's not acknowledging your creator but worshiping part of the creation. So, uh, you know, and so, sometimes people want to differentiate between uh, things that are immoral when it comes to how you treat your neighbor. So, you know, it would be the second table of the law as opposed to the first table of the law because if you don't acknowledge God is that, that Yahweh is the only true God, then you know a lot of people will always be breaking those laws, but they might try to keep the other ones, right? So other cultures, right? So Buddhists try to be nice to people. Are they fulfilling the law? Only the second table of the law, loving your neighbor. But I, even then, I would say that they don't actually follow that because there's a lot of uh, hierarchy in, and a lot of uh, you know biased and uh, you know not necessarily racism, but they have uh, what do you call it? Um, 
the levels. What are they called? The levels uh, in uh, in the uh, well, maybe not Buddhist culture, but like India, right? So um, caste. The caste system is. I mean, people who are of the same nationality. If you're not from the right caste, they will. You're an untouchable, right? And so it's okay to be prejudiced in India against people of lower castes, but in uh, you know when that when that gets transported out of India to other countries, I think that that's one of the things that um, some new countries like I think that they've made it illegal in some states, and they made it illegal in Great Britain to not uh, be prejudiced against people because of their caste. For instance, like in there was a uh, people from different Indian castes in in the in the Google uh, uh, bi- um, you know in Google's business, right? And so what happened is somebody didn't get a, a job promotion because he was a lower caste and the guy who was an upper caste wouldn't give it to him and he was sued and he won because of that. So that's the kind of stuff that you see in other cultures is that they, they, they think that they're doing what's right when they're trying to be nice to their neighbor. But um, the Bible says, I think it's in 2 Corinthians, that, in, that everything that's done without faith is sin. So you, you can't be moral if you don't acknowledge the true God because then it's just perfunctory. You're doing it because you're trying to make yourself either look better or it's out of pride or you think that you, you, have, yeah, or you have the power to earn your own way to heaven because, well, look, I'm better than other people. And, you know, everybody is a sinner, as it says in Romans 5, verse 23. We've all sinned and sh- fallen short of the glory of God. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the value of a stone has to do with what it could be used for, right? And and so actually maybe we can end by going to the end of verse thirty-five because this stone, okay, a, a stone is actually stronger than a lot of these metals, right? And and uh, and if a stone is shaped right, like the capstone in an arch, the arch won't work without that without the perfect shaped stone. So without the perfectly shaped stone, you can't actually do a whole lot. So like a the, um, cause the word in the, in the Hebrew capstone or foundation stone, it could be used interchangeably. It means either one of them. So if you have the right foundation stone, then the building won't fall because the stone is strong enough. So it's the strength of the So it's the strength of the stone. And, uh, um, uh, they did, but I don't know if they, I don't even, it wasn't important. What could you do? You can't build with diamonds. There were, they, you never find one big enough to use for anything. They, sure, they were valuable because they looked pretty, but they weren't good for building. But let's end with the last part of verse, uh, let's read 35. Putting the iron the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff, and threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue is in the Greek mountain and filled the whole earth. Yeah, so notice how the, if the stone is simply another kingdom, then it doesn't seem like it's going to last forever. But this tells us that the stone became a huge mountain. So the growth from a stone to a huge mountain, what does that represent? G- okay, Jesus, Christianity. So this final empire is not so much an empire, but it's going to be the thing that's going to fill the whole earth. It's going to be of divine origin. It's going to be this stone that uh, was cast away by the builders and it becomes the capstone, so it's talking about Jesus. And definitely it has a, 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 an eternal quality and it's, an ex, it, it's a kingdom that will extend to the end of the earth. And that's exactly what Jesus said in Acts 1 verse 8. And he says to his disciples, as he, and today is Ascension Day, so as Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, he told his disciples, uh, to, you know, to take, he says, um, go and receive the wait for the power from on high, that you know, so the Holy Spirit would come on Pentecost, which was ten days later. And he says, and preach the gospel in Jerusalem and Judea and to the very ends of the earth. And so here it says that this huge mountain would fill the whole earth. So it's talking about the Christian faith, not just an institution, not just another kingdom, but the Messiah's 
reign is going to extend everywhere. And, you know, some people might say, has Christianity reached the ends of the earth already? Maybe. But it hasn't reached the hearts of everybody. There are lots of places where people don't know about Jesus. Even though you could find out about him online in China, very few people know about Jesus. In India, the, it's actually the most populated country on earth now. It, it passed China recently. They have more, they have more than 2 billion people, 2.1 billion. And in India, there are very few people who know anything about Jesus. It's not because they couldn't find out, but how do you look for something you don't know about, right? You, you only know what you know. And, uh, and so cr Christianity is still in the beginning stages, even though you know, at one time the, India was part of the, uh, the British Empire, and the British Empire was uh, Christian, but they never penetrated with the gospel into, into India. So there's a lot of people who need to hear about Jesus in India. Hinduism is the biggest religion, Hinduism, right? and then Buddhism is second. And they, they don't eat cows. Yeah, because you might eat your ancestor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, definitely Christianity is, is being described in his dream. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream is being interpreted as, sure, there's all these empires that are coming and going, but the final and the most important one is the messianic era ushered in by the Savior, Jesus, who is going to make a, a, is going to affect the earth, and it's going to be this huge mountain. It's going to be so much stronger than anything else you've ever imagined. And Nebuchadnezzar stopped listening after the gold head. <laughs> and the interesting thing is, it's actually five kingdoms. Yeah. So the fifth kingdom is the final kingdom. Is Next week. is Christianity, right? Okay. So yeah. So it, it teaches us a lot about um, you know he was trying to flatter King. Uh, let's see. Let's, well, in verse thirty six, we'll we'll start with verse 36 next week, where he, he uh, starts to interpret it. Um, I've already started interpreting it, but uh, the way he explains it to the king, you know, there's a reason for the, why, the way that he does this. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll finish in like verse 35. Politician in verse 36. Yeah, and next week when we get to verse 36. Yeah, and it's not so much that he's being a politician. It's 37. It's that he, uh, that he understands the reason why God gave him the interpretation. And part of it was, you know, it troubled Nebuchadnezzar's heart, and now he wants to ease his heart. And so God is actually doing this for a reason. It's so that Daniel and his friends will survive. And the faith of the, of the Old Testament will go on. And so we'll see what he says next week. So we'll end here.